Hello, hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Lunch and a Bite. I'm just going to do a couple things that are happening at the museum. My name is Amy Johnson. I am the Programs and Visitor Services Manager here. So we have got a lot going on. Um, welcome to the 11 week kids camp program um, setting. So we are currently in week five of that. Uh, it's an 11 week program. It goes for kids that have finished kindergarten that have through finished fifth grade. We do still have some openings in that program if you're interested. We also have now, we're gonna do some special excursions for the kids. And we now have those open if you just wanna do a one day thing. So there's more information on those excursions in the back if you just wanna go one day. We're gonna go out to Jeffers, we're gonna go to the Lower Sioux, and we're gonna go to Sleepy Eye. So those are some options. If you know some kiddos who might be interested, we've got some slots. So also you know the popcorn wagon is happening. Our schedule is back there, also on our online if you're interested. Um, the Kiesling House is open Fridays and Saturdays from noon to four. This weekend we have Joanne Huss at the spinning wheel from one to four. And then next weekend we're gonna do some chair caning uh, there. So please join us for that. That's just a drop in thing so you don't have to come stay the entire time. Um, Let's see, so this will be, we'll be taking a break from Lunch and a Bite after this month because August is gonna be the 160th commemoration of the U.S. Dakota War. All of that is now available online if you're interested in any of that. We've got walking tours, we've got bus excursions, we've got special speakers, we've got memorial commemorations, and we've got our banquet up at Turner. So there's a couple of flyers back there, otherwise the information is available online. Uh, as far as tickets are concerned, we are currently pricing that out. So if you want more information, I also have a sign-up sheet back there for you on that. And we also have the Popcorn Wagon Blast will be coming up here in September. So there's a poster back there for that. That should also be online soon as well. So as far as that's concerned, that's what's happening at the museum. Um, but as far as George Downs is concerned, welcome today. We are going to talk about William Fender, William Fender, the grand old man of New Ulm. But George himself is the great grandson of William Fender through Marion Fender Downs and Albert Fender, William's youngest son. George and his wife Trish moved to New Ulm four years ago to retire and return to his roots. Before he retired, Mr. Downs spent his career first in ocean engineering engaged in port and harbor development worldwide, and then in international sales and marketing, principally in Japan and Germany. And he's here today to talk to us about his great grandfather. So thank you everyone for coming and let's welcome George Downs. Thank you, Amy. Uh, just wanted to, to start off uh, with uh, talking about my great grandfather with a uh, background of how I got into this and how I got into New Ulm. And my wife and I lived as the announcement, uh, as Amy said, a pretty active life. Uh, we've lived in two different countries and six states, and I think we had uh, lived in 14 towns, had 23 houses, and and. Uh, Sort of the, at the end of that, we were, we were four years ago, uh, maybe it's five years ago now, uh, we, did, we were looking for a place to, to set, settle down, and we didn't know where that would be. So we uh, sort of looked over all over the country. We were living in an RV, traveling around the country for a couple of years. And one day I thought, hey, you know, I want to find a place where they have roots, because we didn't have any roots. So I guess I'm... I'm short one slide here. Uh, again, this is about William, Wilhelm, but I was, we were looking for roots. And here's where I found roots. Uh, oops, from, boy, well, no, this is hard, this is difficult. Uh, just right. That's my mother and father, that's my, grand, uh, my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather. That's my great-grandfather and my other great-grandfather and his wife live right there. So we had roots and this was the place to be. So we decided to move here and uh, 
came and when we did, uh, we all over the town, all over town, I kept seeing things like when we we bought our house. Well, if you can't read that, maybe this way it would work. Uh, but in the in the abstract of everybody in the town is that in the introductory phases, there's there's uh, where William Fender there. He's the Justice of the Peace, and he's the the president of the Land Association, and uh, he does other things down here. I mean, all over the all over the place you see his his name, and I was really surprised by that. And down in Ger uh, German Park, there's a nice sign with the founders, with uh, Mr. Beinhorn and uh, Mr. Fender. And on the back, as can't read that very well, it says Fender, Grand Old Man of New Ulm. And I saw the Grand Old Man of New Ulm. I said, what does that what does that really mean? And what did do what did he do deserve being called the Grand Old Man of New Ulm? So I started researching into it, and just to Again, this is, this is the, the two fenders, Wilhelm and Catherine Fowl. I'll talk about them more later. They had a large family, 15 children. Uh, of them, 12 survived. Uh, four of them succumbed to the milk fever uh, and other afflictions. And 10 of them uh, lived long enough to be married. They had 40 grandchildren, uh, 58 great-grandchildren, and more than 100 great-great-grandchildren. Uh, my son sitting back there is one of the great great grandchildren. <laughs> uh, so this, these are his four sons, and I'll go through these because people may recognize some of, some of them. Uh, the oldest son was uh, Will, William William Jr., and he was a, a horticulturist. He had a nursery uh, in in town. I'm not sure where that was, but it was on, I think on the north side of town, and he. Uh, developed some unique uh, fruit species, pears. I think he had one that was named after him. And I think the, the, of his descendants, the one that's most well known is Tom Fender, who was a uh, coach at the, at the uh, uh, high school. And then the next one is Fred Fender, and he was the uh, fire chief for many years and then was in the uh, uh, New Home Telephone Company and was in that for many years, and he, I think he retired when he was 94. Uh, then this is uh, Herman Fender, and Herman Fender was the one that took over the Fender farm. Uh, he was, he was uh, wanted to be a farmer, so he took over the Fender farm from uh, my, my great-grandfather, who wasn't much of a farmer. He had a farm, but he, he didn't spend much time there. And then the last one is Albert Fender, and that's, that's my father, my grandfather. And he was a uh, city attorney and a uh, state representative. He ran for governor and lost, uh, and was uh, most, most known for being disbarred and fired for counseling uh, Germans to uh, file for con to become conscientious objectors during the World War. They didn't want to go back and shoot their family, so uh, he advised them to be, become conscientious objectors, but to support his country. And for that, he was disbarred uh, and fired as a city attorney. He got the jobs back in, a, in, a, in a, about a month or so, but he had to go around and give a mea culpa speech to every town in Brown County. Uh, I've got copies of that, and it's, uh, I wouldn't want to read it myself. Uh, but he had six daughters, and these are, they all look alike, so I've, it's hard to, hard to figure out who they are. Uh, but that is, that is uh, Emma, and she married uh, Charles Hauser, who was uh, involved in, I think, grain or something in, uh, in St. Paul. That is uh, Amalia, who married uh, Albert, uh, Dr. Albert uh, Fritchie. And they had two two sons who were who were doctors, and those do, those doctors had doctors. So it's a lot of medical medicine in the family. And, and Ted Fritchie was the last one. He died about uh, nineteen about two thousand about two thousand I think it was, uh, and at about ninety six. Uh, then there was uh, Minnie Minnie Lindholt. Uh, 
lived here for a part of her, uh, her final years, but lived elsewhere. Uh, that's Catherine uh, and uh, Catherine Albrecht. And uh, again, not, we don't know too much about her. Uh, this one is Joseph, Josephine Fender, who uh, was a spinster and was the last one to live in, in the, the Fender house. And this is uh, Louise Stan. There were two others who, uh, who died, who lived for to 16 or 21, and one of them was married. But uh, that's the, so that's the daughters. And uh, just to go over my sources, there are a lot of, a lot of sources here. Uh, this, this, oops, get back to this. Uh, uh, this is the, by Len, Minnie Lenholt, and this is sort of a fiction, uh, like historical fiction, uh, but it's interesting reading. And uh, there's a lot of others, and, and a lot, some of them I did for personal communications. Uh, Willis Runk uh, had a few beers with Danny Warda and learned a lot. Uh, and of course, uh, Darla Gebhardt, and uh, who provided a lot of information. And my, my style with all these resources, they, they, they didn't always agree. In fact, they rarely agreed in, on some major points. So my style was to go through and read everything, consult uh, Deb, uh, Darla, go through and figure everything out and come with my own conclusion. And then I put down what Darla told me to do. So. <laughs> So that's how, that's how it worked. Uh, okay, Wilhelm Fenner was born July 6th, yesterday. Uh, he was 194 yesterday, in 1826. Uh, born in Heilbronn, Germany. Uh, Heilbronn is, I, I find it inter interesting because it's very similar. You could, you could almost put, put New Ulm right there. Got a navigable waterway and uh, farming all around it, so it's it's very similar to to New Ulm. This is uh, Jacob Fender, who is was his father. He fought in uh, the uh, well, I think Battle of Waterloo was on Napoleon side, so he was a he was a loser. But he came back he came back to town and and uh, he survived, which is good. Uh, he survived, came to Heilbrunn, and this is the house that. Uh, according to Hans Müller, uh, who's a historian, uh, th this one of the mattress out the window, that's, that's the Fender house. And you can see the cobblestone streets. And I, when I went to, I, I visited Harborn about 30 years ago, and I was fascinated by the cobblestone streets that had been laid by laborers like my great, great, great grandparents who were, who were cobblestone masons. Uh, his, Wilhelm's family were, they were coopers, so he, he learned the art of barrel making, and he was a pre apprentice to a merchant at uh, the age of 14, and worked as a clerk, uh, but he was very active in sports, and when he was about 19, he and a bunch of the other guys heard about the, uh, the Turnverein movement, uh, which had been started in 1911 and in Germany, and so they started a, a, a Turnverein there, and he was one of the founding members of the of the Turnverein. And he, uh, uh, well, last 2020, I was invited to represent Wilhelm Fender at the I don't know 160th anniversary, I guess it was, of the founding of the Turnverein. Unfortunately, it was cut off by by uh, uh, COVID, but I was very very happy to, to find it. He was really recognized as a, as a, a major founder. Uh, this, this is a, a cathedral of Heilbronn where Wilhelm was baptized. And I put a question mark there because there's no, no indication that he ever had any religious leanings in his life, but he just may, may have been baptized as a, uh, as a matter of local practice. Uh, so he, when he was about 20, he went to Ulm, and he was a, uh, worked for a, a grocery store there in Ulm, also that involved in gymnastics, and, and, and he founded, they founded a, uh, a Turnverein in Ulm. So this was a, a major theme of his life. Wherever he went, he, Turnverein was involved. And, but when he was 22, he left the country 
uh, mostly for because of uh, uh, political upheaval. Let's see, is there, a, there was supposed to be another one in there? Oh, yeah. So he uh, he went, and on the way, he, he stopped off in London and visited his uh, brother, Carl Fender, who was seven years older. And Carl uh, was a, a, a miniature painter, painted these little miniatures. And he uh, was uh, basically worked as a, uh, a, a an advocate for workers in Germany. Germany, the Germans were the lowest class, they were the lowest laboring class uh, in, in England, and they were very much mistreated. And so he, was, he fought for their rights. And he had a couple of other guys that he worked with. Uh, these are his friends. Uh, this thing is a pro protesting against uh, mistreatment of Germans. And, oops, and down I get it down here. Chairman Karl Marx, Chairman Karl Fender, and Frederick Engels. Those were the, the people, and they really call themselves the Democratic Socialist Committee for German Political Refugees. That was an, one organization. Later on, they morphed into the uh, Communist Party, and, <coughs> and Karl was uh, kind of a membership chairman. And he examined everybody that came in. He was a phrenologist. And if you don't know what a phrenologist is, it's a person who, who tells a person's character by feeling the bumps on his head. And that's really what he did. He wasn't much of a political uh, guy. He was, he was just a sort of, a, he loved people and he worked with people. But people didn't think too much of phrenologists. This is the best picture I could find of, of phrenology. I think he's a little bit more serious than that guy. Uh, but he did have some success. His, I think his triple great granddaughter is the one in the yellow and black, whatever that is. And that's, uh, that's pa Posh Spice of the Spice Girls, uh, later married to uh, David Beckham, the great uh, uh, British soccer star. Uh, she's my third cousin twice removed, so <laughs> it's the only famous person in my family. Uh, so Wilhelm went to New York, and while he was there, he had a letter of introduction to a, a Turner named Hecker, uh, and he, so he went to where he was living, but Hecker had moved on to Cincinnati, and Wilhelm didn't have any money, so he got a job as a cooper, Worked for two months, got enough money to go to Cincinnati, and he uh, he went to Cincinnati. While he was there, he met, uh, stayed in the hotel uh, with a hostler named uh, Jacob Fowl, who had four daughters, which is nice. Uh, <coughs> this is the over the Rhine district of Cincinnati, and this is where the Germans settled. They called it over the Rhine because when, you, when they came to work, they worked other places and they'd have to basically sail across the river to get back. Uh, so they called it uh, the over the Rhine. And uh, he, he worked uh, at various jobs there, uh, but he, uh, uh, he, in I think it's 1852, there was a, a serious uh, outbreak of cholera in Cincinnati. So he went across the, the, the river, uh, and if I could go back just a little bit, one of the main things he did in Cincinnati to begin with, within about four months of time he was there, he founded another turnverein. The bike guys got together, he founded the turnverein, and he was the first president of the, of the Cincinnati turnverein. Uh, but the cholera epidemic drove them out of town, and so they went across the river to Newport, Kentucky. And so Jacob and his family and William Wilhelm went there. And while he was there, he married uh, his uh, oldest daughter of the hostler, Catherine Fowle. And he also founded another turnverein in Newport. And because the, the bridges that are there, you can see the bridges now. At that time, there weren't any bridges. 
So in the winter time, they couldn't get across the river to go and go to to the Cincinnati. That's why they founded another one in Newport. Uh, so things went all right there. He worked uh, for a, a, a German newspaper, uh, wrote a lot of articles, uh, uh, mostly about uh, Germans uh, living in in uh, the country, uh, the difficulties of, of being a free thinker in a in a uh, religious country, which was one of his uh, articles. But in 1855, things were starting to get rough, and this is a, a picture of the of the a cartoon of the free thinkers, the, free, uh, the or the German the Germans. And the German on the right with the beer, and the Irishman with the whiskey, he's a Catholic, and they're stealing the ballot box. So that's how the, that's how the, uh, the free thinkers, or not free, excuse me, know nothings. <laughs> the know nothing party uh, tried to get rid of immigrants and uh, Catholics. And it got really serious. And in 1855, they, uh, this is an actual, drawing from 1855, uh, the smoke is coming from the, over the Rhine district. And they actually tried to, to get in there, and, but the, the Germans barricaded around the, 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 their, their district and they were able to repel uh, uh, the, the know-nothings. So w Wilhelm, being a, uh, a visionary, he wrote a, a, a paper called Practical Turnerism in which he said, if we want to live our life the way we want to live it, we've got to get out of town and build a town of our own. So he got, he submitted it to the local Turnverein, they approved it, and went to the national Turnverein, and they proved it, and they provided some financial support to look for land for a place to go, to live. So he prepared a business plan, he sold stock, and when they had about $6,000 in eight, late 1855, Fender, Seeger, and Prizer, three uh, of the men, uh, were dispatched to find a home uh, for, for the Turners. And he looked at, they looked in Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, and Minnesota, but they also heard of the land, Chicago Land Association venture in New Ulm. And so they thought, this sounds good. They tr went and tried, uh, took a look. And New Alm at the time was, uh, they were established, but they needed no money and, and more people. And so Wilhelm arrived with uh, both and negotiated the purchase of the town and told them they would have more money and more people coming. So, between the, the Beinhorn group, the Chicago group, and uh, the, uh, the Cincinnati group, they formed the German Land Association, and Wilhelm uh, became the president. Now, uh, shortly after that, in, in fall, the fall of 80, uh, 1856, they arrived at, in, uh, in New Ulm, and I'll, I'll show you a picture later of the, the landing. But uh, they landed, and Fender uh, founded his farm right up here. You see this gooseneck here? He's right, right by that uh, gooseneck in the river. And that was full of water then. It's, it's dry now. And the, the, actually, the landing place, I think, got, that's, that's 20th Street. and. Uh, down there is the uh, the landing, right? Uh, probably about that that straight. Where there's a navigable waterway, that's a good place to, to have a have a dock. And you've you've probably seen this mon monument on uh, 20th South. It's been moved around a lot, but uh, what it says is on May 7th of 1857, the steamer Franklin Steel landed with about 60 families from Cincinnati. And this was the second group that arrived. Uh, Wilhelm and uh, about 70 people had arrived the, the previous fall and then in the spring uh, of the next year, uh, more people came. 
Uh, again, this is the this is the Fender Farm. Uh, this right here, and that's where the houses and barns and everything were. And this used to be an active part of the river, but it's it's been cut off now. Uh, he built his he built his farmhouse right where those houses were. And across the road from that, uh, you may have seen the, there's a marker there, and it says 77 feet in, uh, or excuse me, 717 feet in that direction, uh, is where the, turn, the New Ulm Turnbrine was was founded, right across from his farm. Uh, and this, uh, this is the this is 717 feet from that, uh, the middle of the woods, but it could have could easily have been here at the, I think the cider, the cider, if it was farm, uh, was over, our store was over here. And that's where they went to, to go and, and have their meetings until they built the, the, the Turnverein in town. And it's a pretty, pretty rugged <laughs> territory. So the, the first house burned down and then Herman Fender uh, built this house, and it burned down, and he built the, this house that is the present, the present uh, house on the farm. There's another one that uh, Willis Runk, who is, is, lives there now, uh, is, and he's a, he's a great grandson of uh, Wilhelm. Yeah, I, did, I didn't mention there, there, there are three of us living in town, w Willis Runk and uh, Ruthie Stoll, our three great grandchildren out of the 58 that were, were shown. So this was this was, for, uh, was Herman's house, but Wilhelm was extremely active. I mean, he had a farm, but he was the president of the land association. He was the justice of the peace. He f performed the first marriage uh, in town, which was uh, to to Petronella Adams, which was uh, George Glotzbach's great grandmother. So I learned that from George. He made <laughs> took me down to the where, where it took place and the, the sign is and everything. So. Uh, that was a big deal. Uh, he was a registrar of deeds for Brown County. He was the postmaster, and he uh, was was principally responsible for writing up the, the initial charter of the town of New Ulm. And the thing I liked about it best was he he had a paragraph in there about religious freedom, whether there will be no in the town, there will be no uh, religion involved in the government, but everybody is free to practice what they want. So, I mean, he was a true free thinker. Uh, he had his own opinions, but he respected everybody else's to have their own. They built the first Turner Hall, and I really like this part of it because the first Turner Hall had three things, a school, a gymnasium, and a bar. <laughs> now, that's, that's pure Turnerism and uh, uh, pure G German uh, behavior. And that's what we have up there. We have, well, there's no school, but there's a gymnasium and a bar. So uh, he had a lot of, of civic duties. Uh, he was the first representative for the district. He was elected as selected as a presidential elector, and there were there were eight eight people, four Republicans and four Democrats, that were uh, to be select, selected to be electors. And the governor said, "Well, there's so many Germans. We better have one of them in each party be Germans." And so. That's how, that's how he got selected, uh, as being one of the Germans in the, uh, in the, uh, the House and cast the vote for Lincoln, which is one thing he's well remembered for. He signed up for the military in 1860 and was commissioned as a first lieutenant and ultimately was sent to war with the military, uh, Minnesota First Artillery. And that's a picture of him in uh, his Civil War uniform. And he's best known for uh, the, the first artillery was at Shiloh, and they were very instrumental in holding the line against the, the, the rebel charges. And there's a, 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 this is the monument at the, at the location that the, the gun emplacements were. And I'll, I'll just read this. Difficult in here, uh, but it just said that that uh, early in the morning, uh, Captain Munch, who was the, the commander, was wounded and disabled in the first day's battle, 
and Shiloh on April 6, 1862. The right and left sections under command of First Lieutenant William Fender participated in the struggles of the hornet's nest, uh, and two other guns were, were, were disabled, and he took, he took command of the group with, with the, the other, with the other first lieutenant down and the captain down, he took command. And everybody wanted to run, but he called them, called them back. In one of the books on Shiloh, I read that, that they became disorganized and they started to run away, and Wilhelm called them back, routed them up, and they helped to save the day, uh, stayed until late at night, and, and they won the battle. Uh, but at the same time, shortly after that, the Dakota conflict started. And of course, he was, he was somewhere in the uh, southeast of the U.S. Uh, Catherine was at home with the kids. And so Jacob Nix, uh, who was in charge of the, the uh, uh, defense at that, uh, for, the first, for the first charge, uh, went out to, Catherine wouldn't come out because she said, I, I, I take care of the, the uh, Indians, I feed them, uh, they're not gonna bother me. Well, Jacob Nix didn't take that. He said, look, Wilhelm's gonna be after me if anything happens to his kids, so we're going to town. So he took the kids to town, and of course she followed. Uh, and while they were, while they were there, uh, I, I like to talk about this one, the, 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 the stories around the battle say that all the women were kept in a, uh, in a basement with a powder keg at the door and somebody was in charge of the powder, powder keg in case the, the, the Indians arrived. And of course, my grandmother was one of the ones that had the, I think every, everybody's grandmother, great-grandmother, was there in charge of the blowing it up because everybody's, every, everybody <laughs> says they are. Uh, but I, I don't believe that they, they stayed in the basement. I think the women were out there helping the wounded and, and um, uh, filling muskets and, and doing everything that they could to support the, the effort. So they weren't, they, did, they weren't cowering in the basement. They were out uh, helping. Uh, Wilhelm got sent home by General Grant because of the, the battle. And uh, made a, he made him uh, commandant of Fort Ridgely, or he was made commandant of Fort Ridgely, promoted a co uh, colonel, and put in charge of the Minnesota, Minnesota Ranger Group that was pacifying Minnesota. So he continued to uh, be in the Army until 18, he was discharged in 1865. Went back to the farm and uh, was elected mayor, so he's back in the government business. This is him about 1870. <coughs> he always has the beard. Uh, and he was in uh, 70, he was elected uh, state senator and went to the first capital. Uh, the cap this capital actually was, was abandoned in 1872, so he, had, he was there during the transition. He had a house right, right uh, on a section of land near it. And after state senator, he was the uh, state treasurer uh, for, uh, for two sessions. Uh, so he, he had been an accountant before, uh, so he knew how to handle money, and so he was elected. Uh, during the, the <coughs> excuse me, during the uh, election, uh, he was accused of bribery by his opponent because uh, he had seen Wil Wilhelm handing uh, cash to the uh, head of the Senate. Well, it turns out that the head of the Senate was a granary supplier, and Wilhelm had bought some, some uh, product from him and, and was just simply paying him off. So when they investigated, it was just thrown out, and maybe that helped him win. So he continued to grow old, didn't do a lot, but uh, he did engage in real estate and insurance business. Uh, he was the co-chairman of the Grand Army of the Republic chapter in New Ulm and spent mo most of his remaining years uh, in that capacity. He was also, in 1881, uh, New, Ulm, New Ulm had a severe cyclone that uh, practically destroyed the town. And 
Uh, so Wilhelm gathered people together and took a committee up to the governor and asked for money. And they were given $40,000, which uh, uh, a lot of money, it just took, by comparison, it took $43,000 to build the, the second capital that they had up there. The first one burned out, or was, was abandoned, but the second one cost $43,000 to build a whole, whole capital building. That's how much they got, and he was in charge of, of distributing it. And, and Darrell said maybe that's, uh, that's how they got in the insurance business, because uh, if people had insurance before the cyclone, they'd be a lot better off. But uh, he just continued to live in town, and this is where the uh, how Fender House was. It was at uh, 3rd and Broadway, and it's right where Am the Ampey uh, offices are now down there. I don't know when it was, do you know when it was torn down? I guess in the late 30s. Yeah, late 30s, something like that. Uh, so, but it's not there anymore. So this is just a picture of the two of them later on. Uh, after 15 children, I, she looks, she <laughs> still looks in pretty good shape. Uh, amazing. Uh, so this is this is the last picture we found of of, uh, of Wilhelm. It's obviously probably close to the time he died in the in the early, early 2000s, uh, and uh, another. Side that uh, Darla said is that uh, told me that that uh, when they had uh, parades, they used to have a lot of parades up uh, Broadway, that they would go and he'd stand here and watch them, and they'd salute him as they came by, so they all remembered. So I I wanted to, to find out you know, why how how did he do what he did because you know, this uh, to me is. He, he accomplished a lot in his life. And so I, these four points, I think, are, are significant. I think he obviously had a lot of self-confidence. He, to do, to, to know, uh, think that what he was doing was right. And that's uh, a pretty strong thing. The ability to lead, and not only to lead, but to inspire others to follow. And that's demonstrated by, at uh, Shiloh and, uh, he came up with this idea of move, moving to town, and I, about 600 people followed him. So he, he was a pretty good leader. Uh, he had a willingness to make civic contributions over personal gain. I mean, other people were building, building things and making money, and he was, he was governing and taking care of the people. And I think the most important is, is vision backed by initiative. I used to work for a, a, a captain in the Navy, and I came to him with an idea one time. I said, oh, well, "This is an old, just an old idea. We don't want to do this." And he thought it was a he thought it was a good idea. And he told me, he says, "Ideas are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. It takes genius to get things done, and, and genius is in in the initiative." To get it. So I think he really was able to get things done, uh, and the practical turnerism and coming to New Ulm was. Uh, was the best example. So on August 11th, 1905, uh, he died. And he got nice uh, articles in the paper. And I'll see if I can read it over here. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the article, the paragraph that I like. It says, more than any other man in the city, Colonel Fender is recognized as the first citizen, the grand old man of New Ulm. He came to this place from Cincinnati after wandering over parts of several states in search of a livable <laughs> location for the colony he was supposed to represent. And so I rest my case that I think he deserves to be called the grand old man of New Hall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Yes. George, I had a guy, I was volunteering at the museum and I had a German man come in and somehow we were talking about Fender and I said, yeah, he was an insurance man. Uh, and the guy said, well, that's no surprise. His name means tax collector. <laughs> Do you know if that's, if that's correct? 
I don't. I, I don't. I've never heard that. Well, that that is interesting. Yeah, because he was a he was a government a government agent. <laughs> that's right. No, that's interesting. Dan, yeah. No, I, I really haven't. I, I don't even know if he had any horses on his farm. Uh, it's, I mean, probably, obviously they, 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 they must have, but, but he, he did work as, as a farmer, but you know, he had, he had so many other things to do. That, uh, I know he had uh, one, of the, one of the stories from the, the Indian War is that, uh, that uh, after it was all over, the last person to, to, to be killed was the, the uh, foreman or handyman, what a foreman of, of his farm who was working, working out in the for, farm and a small band of Indians just sort of just saw him and shot him right in the middle of the field. Uh, so uh, he, he, did, uh, he did farming, so that's a, that's a good point about horses. Yes. Well, the best that I can say is that Ted Fritchie and my mother <laughs> petitioned the city and got it got it named, and and I know they paid for the sign too. I mean that's that that's one way things get done, but I believe that's how, that, what it was. I think it was that uh, two of his grandchildren uh, petitioned the city to at least two. What's that? Yeah, to, to erect the marker and then to call it Fender Park, yeah. Anything else? Yes? So there's a street up there somewhere. Is it called Fender Drive? Yeah. And why, and why is that? Because you live there? No. Uh, yeah, Darla. She knows. Okay. Yes. Tell about your connection to your current house. The connection to my current house. Okay. Uh, you would, I said early on that we're, my wife and I are mobile people. We've been married for 60 years and lived everywhere. And so, so I bought this house, that, the first house. I bought it online. We bought it online. We never even saw it. We bought it and moved into it uh, and loved it. And, and my son's living in it now. But we had an opportunity to buy another house, which we did, and then uh, another thing came, opportunity came up, and uh, Dick Kimmel uh, lived in the house, the third house up from the uh, corner of, uh, let's see, that'd be the southwest corner of uh, Center and Broadway, and uh, that happened to be the house that my grandfather built, and. Uh, that uh, my mother was married in and born in and married in. And so there was a lot of family connection to that. And uh, when I, first time I ever saw it, I, I asked him, I said, uh, well, if you, if you ever want to sell, give me first right of refusal. So last summer, he, he and Sue were up, in, uh, up near their lake and, and they, they decided that they didn't want to travel the four hours back and forth every time they wanted to go to the lake. They wanted to buy something closer. So they, he gave me a call and said, are you still interested? And so I called my family and a couple of my daughters were very interested in it. So we, we bought it and we're living in it now. And I, I remember it as a, a wonderful place to come because uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting house. And I, 
came here until I was about eight, I think it was, and then that's when my, my grandparents died and, uh, and the house was sold. But uh, remember that very fondly and I'm enjoying living in it now. So, so that's that connection. Yes? Very, very interesting. Yeah, they were able to fire cannons every 20 seconds. At, uh, very interesting, Danny. Very dangerous. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you again, George, for being here today. That was lovely. Um, thank you, NewCat, also for being here and recording this. So this presentation will be available on our website for anyone who missed it. Um, also, again, we'll take a break in August for Lunch and a Bite, but we will re be resuming in September, date yet to be determined. I believe Ted Marty is going to join us to continue on from a presentation that he did a few years ago. So um, as far as the U.S. Dakota War information is concerned, again, on our website, we will be doing signups uh, for the speakers and we will be, you know, the tickets will be available for the bus tours soon. So stay tuned for that. If you have any questions or you want to leave your name for more information, I'll email you when I get that all figured out. So um, thank you again for coming today. All right. Thanks.